everyone. Okay, I'm going to make a start. Uh, we still get some more people joining. Um, so, welcome everyone. This is the British Interplanetary Society, the, uh, the West Midlands branch. Uh, and uh, today we have uh, Robin Haig from Sky Rora. And I, I know this is a, 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 given the numbers that have registered, this is a, a, a very popular talk. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to hand over to my uh, colleague, um, uh, Mark, and he's going to say a few words, and I'll share my screen with you, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. So, as uh, as Bob said, welcome to uh, to this uh, April's uh, West Midlands talk. If you can move on, Bob. Uh, or not. <laughs> as we all know, we're here to hear Robin talk about uh, Skyrora launch vehicle and there will be a questions and answers session starting about 1440. If the questions and answers go on, which I expect them to, um, uh, to uh, three o'clock, we will observe a minute silence uh, for the, uh, uh, the uh, Prince Philip, uh, uh, the national minute silence. So do bear with us. Um, Bob, could you move on? As always, BIS is always looking for material for uh, the magazines and, of course, talks, both uh, for the branches and for headquarters. So if you're interested in writing something or giving a talk, uh, please do get in touch with either ourselves at, at the branch or any of the other branches or headquarters. Um, can we move on, Bob? And the normal sort of thing. BIS does lots of good stuff, videos, talks, lectures, you've got the magazines, the newsletter, the website, um, and of course the camaraderie of these, the question and answer sessions I find work really well, it's a, it's a nice thing to do. Uh, move on please Bob. And if you're interested in this and you're not a member and you're enjoying these things, as you know we don't charge, but it would be great to get more members in. BIS definitely needs more members. Uh, we need the, uh, the the society needs the income. So with that, please move on, Bob. And with that, over to Robin. At least this way round has the advantage that I can, I've, I've got a view of what you're seeing as well, so I can see that things are progressing. So yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you all today. Uh, I'm Robin Haig. I'm uh, launch team leader for um, uh, for Skyrora. Uh, I, I know. Uh, Quite a few of you know of us all that know us already, uh, but by way of introduction, we're one of the new prospective space launch companies. We were we're based in Edinburgh, and we we're established in 2017, and we're we're working towards being able to offer satellite launch services from the prospective UK spaceport, wherever that ultimately settles down to be. Uh, this is the vehicle that we're working towards. Uh, this is Skyrora XL, and um, it is uh, twen uh, 22 metres tall, 2.2 metres diameter. So for, for those that are familiar with, with Edinburgh, um, it's, it, I always want, wish I could make the comparison to the Scott Monument. The Scott Monument's actually bigger. It's uh, about the height of Jenner's. It's, um, so it, it'll seem pretty big to be next to, but uh, of course, compared to the, the, uh, the next the next bracket up of things like Falcon 9, it would actually look, look very small. We'd be flying alongside it for some time. Uh, it is a three-stage uh, vehicle, and uh, we're using uh, hydrogen peroxide and kerosene, uh, as inspired by the, the historic UK program. Um, we, uh, so we, we appreciate it's, a, it's possibly an unusual choice um of late to be going for peroxide and kerosene uh, but it does a a number of very good things for us as as it used to do for black arrow we have a, a nice section through the the vehicle here um, and uh, we feel our opportunity for cost effective launch is in simplifying uh, logistics and optimizing manufacturability so it's a, a relatively uh, it's a relatively conventional design uh, paired with some new manufacturing technology. And we have various aspects like the, the first and second stage follow the same basic pattern uh, to, simply, to uh, 
uh, simplify our manufacture. We're reusing the same uh, spherical pressure vessels across the, the vehicle in different places, wherever we can to, to streamline uh, the cost of the vehicle and to make it as user-friendly as possible, which is, of course, one of the things where the peroxide comes in, uh, being a storable propellant. Uh, so uh, we don't have to worry about, about cryogens and the challenges they, they present. And um, uh, normally, normally at this point of the presentations, I'm, I'm always explaining about how it runs in a high mixture ratio, which biases it towards the dense propellant. Um, so it leads to a, a simple compact vehicle. But uh, this audience is, is very, uh, on the whole very well up on the advantages of peroxide and the, the heritage of Black Arrow. Um, we are pursuing a, a number of steps um, towards the vehicle uh, to um, uh, to test say, to, to, to test hardware out in launch environments as soon as possible uh, to make quick and cost effective tests with commercially available solid rocket propulsion and uh, with a, an intermediate vehicle that lets us uh, provides us with a technology demonstration platform uh, on the way to Excel itself. Uh, so across here we have. Uh, the Skylarks, which are named in honor of um, in honor of the original Skylark program as the, the UK's most numerous space vehicle. And we settled on the names Nano and Micro uh, in respect to the fact that they were uh, so so much smaller compared to um, uh, the the original Skylark. Uh, it's, uh, it came out of a, a discussion with Richard Osborne as to, to what we were going to to name these ones. Um, Sky High is an intermediate step, uh, and Skylark L in for Skylark uh, Liquid, which also then ties in quite nicely with the, the Skywar XL name. Um, uh, Nano was our first launch in 2018, and uh, again, this is, is using commercially available solid rocket motors uh, for testing subsystems on a, a smaller scale. Na Nano One um, uh, did make a start with uh, electronics testing. Um, and we were hoping to get some press engagement to, uh, to establish ourselves more broadly to the, the general public. But we were quite uh, unprepared for how much interest it garnered when it, when it flew in, uh, in 2018. Um, uh, we recognize, of course, that this is using uh, equipment um, which is more broadly available. The, uh, commercially available solid rocket motors and the composite tubes that are available from the market already that match the size of the, the, uh, the motors. Um, and the news has a tendency to get rather overexcited really about any launch. Um, but uh, using, the, these, um, using these off the shelf components, uh, we were doing this so that we can very quickly put together a rocket and test systems in a real launch environment. Uh, so we have some footage from on board this particular vehicle. So we're not going very high with this one, um, but uh, it was a, a, a nice start. We're getting up to six kilometers, um, 20,000 feet. And um, as I say, it, it uh, proved, proved very useful in announcing our presence within Scotland, at least by the, uh, the press it, it, it attracted. Um, Uh, the um, uh, this vehicle then has been been used uh, two further times for for other tests. So it's a two stage recovery. We're up to uh, up to apogee in about thirty seconds, and then popping in two uh, with the two halves restrained by a, a parachute line, but no parachute. So we can do a tumble down to a low altitude before the uh, the main parachute comes out. It's a little bit jumpier. Well, it's, it's, it's quite a jumpy video anyway, but it's even more jumpy. I see streaming across Zoom. We'll, um, uh, we'll skip on, but we've got some uh, excellent views of the, the surrounding highlands from this launch. The uh, video recording has moved on so tremendously, of course, with uh, 
with digital cameras and um, the, the density of SD cards that this, this particular footage was, was very nice overall in that uh, it went from the first, seeing the person turn it on on the launch pad up into the sky all the way down again, lying in the highlands waiting to be recovered, the people recovering it, being carried back to the launch site, people looking at it, celebrating, and then being put back in the car that it came. Uh, so it's a small step, uh, and um, we're, we're conscious that um, we, we have to, to, uh, to judge it with these smaller vehicles that, uh, let's say, the press tends to get very enthusiastic, but we, we don't want to be uh, launching vehicles like this and claiming these are our step to, uh, to space. Uh, they're, um, they're part of our development program which leads us on to Skylark Micro, which is a two-stage version of it. And this provided us with the opportunity to uh, investigate launch from Iceland. So again, commercially available solid rocket propulsion. Uh, we can see the two stages on the, the shot on, on the left on the launch rail. Uh, booster, 100 millimeters diameter up to the polished aluminium transition and then a 75 millimeter diameter upper stage. This uh, vehicle is... Um, depending on what it's carrying and, and obviously the conditions is capable of, sort of 26 to 30 kilometers altitude. So um, uh, pushing, uh, pushing to uh, go greater heights than have, have been done in the UK with this sort of um, uh, off-the-shelf hardware. And uh, in this instance, we had the opportunity to launch it from uh, the Langanas Peninsula at uh, Sordanes as pinned up in the top right, the top right-hand corner of Iceland, uh, which does present an, an excellent location for launch. And um, it was a, a tremendously positive experience uh, in terms of the operation of the vehicle and working with the Icelandic authorities as well, who were uh, tremendously enthusiastic. Uh, we can, should be able to show you in any, any moment their flight itself. So a, a, a big aspect of launching these smaller vehicles is that we treat them just the same as we plan for the larger ones. Uh, so you could see in, in that sequence, we had uh, established a, 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 a small scale and minimal mission control for uh, the preparation of the vehicle and uh, for following the telemetry and such from it. Um, and uh, the, the flight was a, was a great success. Um, and um, one, one of the um, major advantages for this is, is also for the, the younger members of the team that um, maybe have not encountered any launches at all. Uh, it, uh, in parallel to uh, this, these uh, flight developments, of course, we've been pursuing the, uh, the broader te technology uh, for the large vehicles um, across, across the whole suite of it, because we're, we're creating they were creating everything in-house, uh, the structures, the propulsion, the electronics and tracking, which is being uh, tested out with the, the smaller vehicles. We are headquartered in Edinburgh. We have our, our office on Princess Street itself. So uh, if, if uh, anyone's uh, recently familiar with Princess Street, we're, we're uh, next to next, uh, pretty much across from the, the castle. We've got an extraordinary view for when uh, customers come to, to see us about launching their satellites, and uh, a model of the XL vehicle can be seen down at the street level. Uh, of course, that's not, uh, not suited for the uh, constructional activities, so we have a, a main workshop at Lone Head just outside the uh, Edinburgh Bypass, um, and uh, that's where the, the majority of the activity, the, the uh, construction activity goes on. We have established a new test site, which we can see in the, uh, the left-hand pictures, uh, where we have been testing our 30 kilonewton uh, peroxide kerosene engine and also the, uh, the smaller uh, uh, 3.5 kilonewton uh, upper stage engine. 
we also have uh, to uh, we also have a resource center in Ukraine where we are fortunate to be able to draw on some of the tremendous experience which is uh, over, over there and um, a European Union base in Slovakia as well. As uh, mentioned briefly earlier, uh, we're using 3D printing additive manufacture for our engines. Um, uh, we want to bring in uh, new technology to uh, streamline the manufacturability of the, the, the vehicle where possible while retaining quite a, a careful and cautious design for the vehicle overall. Um, of, of course, most of the new startup space startups and uh, and those that are not so new now are pursuing additive manufacture as well because of the tremendous opportunity for st for streamlining the manufacture of the vehicles of, of the engines and simply um, uh, reducing the number of parts, uh, printing them with integral cooling channels, enabling more complex shapes, um, and uh, we can we can hugely. Reduce, uh, reduce the, the, the number of parts that are going into the engines. And um, currently we've been using a, a powder bed system and the engine is printed essentially in the largest sections that can fit in the largest printers that are available. But we are now involved in the development of, of this, our uh, proprietary 3D printer, which is a spray deposition. Uh, so this has the tremendous advantage that <laughs> once you've printed your a uh, bi-liquid rocket engine with all its nice integral cooling channels, those integral cooling channels aren't full of dust because that's the uh, the other challenge with the powder bed systems is uh, once it's made, you lift it out of the tank of dust and then you have to find a way of cle uh, clearing out these these uh, small precise channels to make sure that everything's flowing nicely. So this uh, this system will provide us with another leap forward in that we'll be able to build yet bigger sections of the engines in one piece uh, without the, the challenge of the, the dust infill and to machine in place as well because currently if you're printing within the powder bed systems you're then you're taking it out of the printer and then moving it over to a CNC and uh, if we can bring those steps together into one device um, then that should provide uh, further savings in time and cost. Uh, along with this, we, uh, uh, as a uh, as a new program, a clean sheet, we want to minimise our ecological footprint as much as possible from the beginning. So uh, we have uh, uh, developed a program called EcoSeed, where we're looking to generate a, a rocket grade kerosene uh, from non-recyclable plastics, and we actually succeeded in, in having some. Uh, BBC coverage of this yesterday, early on in uh, early on in the day, the news um, uh, with our CEO speaking to BBC about it. Uh, the uh, RP1 is not conveniently available in the UK, and uh, this this uh, recovering uh, recovering material that would otherwise be a significant waste problem to become a fuel source, but it's still a fossil source, of course. Uh, but it's converting it from uh, one problem into a, a, a much lesser one uh, by uh, recovering the resource, reusing the energy, and um, uh, being in an, a rocket engine, being very clean combustion. It also provides the advantage that coming from plastics, uh, the sulfur is already removed. So we can produce a, a rocket rocket grade kerosene from cer certain feed, feedstocks and uh, an aviation grade kerosene from others. And I was was hearing recently from the uh, uh, the the team leader of this that actually uh, expanded polystyrene, the most uh, the, the the worst non-recyclable plastic, the greatest problem of the, the the one that takes up the most space and most difficult to deal with is actually the one that we need for the rocket grade. So uh, that's that's quite nice that uh, we're tackling the the worst of those uh, for this uh, end to this end. And we're using this uh, propellant in our engines, which have been developed uh, solely within Skyrora. On the left-hand side, we have our 30 kilonewton, three-ton thrust uh, uh, peroxide kerosene. And in, this, in this instance, uh, like the gamma, we're cooling the engine with the kerosene, uh, sorry, with the peroxide. 
we have uh, an integral catalyst pack in the, uh, the top of the engine, which takes care of ignition and uh, gas gasification of the peroxide, and then the kerosene is coming straight in. Uh, we've got a full gimballing on it. You can see the electric actuator from one of the axes on the, the left-hand side of the picture. Um, and uh, this is fully 3D printed. You can see, actually, that's a, a good point looking at the picture. You can see the section with the throat is the currently the largest printed piece uh, until the improvement in the printers al allow us to do a, a bigger section, um, a bigger section in one go. Uh, these are printed in Inconel. And the same technology is used for the Leo engine, which is the one on the right, which we can see running when we did our first engine tests at Spaceport Newquay in the hardened aircraft shelter that Bloodhound had been using for their engine tests. And it was great to be able to do something with Newquay because as a horizontal spaceport, uh, of course, we, we, we can't use them, we can't operate from them in future, uh, but uh, they're such a positive and enthusiastic organization. Uh, it was great to be able to, to go there and uh, work with them on our engine tests before we had our own established site. And uh, here is our uh, 30 uh, kilonewton engine under test at the test site that we, we saw in the earlier pictures. So we understand today that the, uh, the audio is not coming through, which I haven't been able to sort out, but uh, um, it does make it easier to speak over it to describe what we've got going on. This is up in the tripod that we had in the picture. We can see the, um, uh, the, the water cooling splashing all over the place and um, a, a successful run of, uh, of the engine. We're using catalytic ignition, as Black Arrow did, um, uh, just ig igniting the engine by opening the valves correctly. So uh, the, the uh, decomposed peroxide ignites the kerosene when it's introduced. And that engine uh, is now fitted into this vehicle, which is Skylark L. And this is our suborbital technology develop a demonstrator for the Skyroar XL orbital vehicle. Uh, the, whole, uh, the whole system for L and also going forward for XL is designed to be as modular and flexible and portable as possible. So in terms of L, you can see it actually it will fit a conventional road trailer. So our transporter erector can be moved around roads normally without requiring any special transport. Uh, as we see it here, it was uh, set up for full stage ground testing in the Highlands. Um, and um, th this was done in summer of last year and uh, de demonstrated the flexibility of the, uh, the system because originally we had the opportunity to use a, an MOD range to, to test this. Uh, but uh, because of the restrictions over last year, even within the summer as things had, had opened up again, the MOD range, uh, understandably, re remained closed to outside activity. So uh, we, we then had to move on to putting together a, a test at a, another location. And uh, we were able to uh, arrange this at a, an estate in the Highlands and were able to get completely set up on this site. You'll, you'll see a, an aerial picture shortly, which gives an idea of how lightweight the, in, the infrastructure we, we require is um, within five days from arriving on the site to performing the engine test. So the only uh, additional equipment beyond that that is currently in shot um, is the command center, which was sited then 600 meters away. Indeed, we've actually got extra stuff there because the workshop container is in there as well. If we, uh, if we pause on this, we can see the transporter erector, um, which also serves as the launch pad. 
the strong back has remained in place for this test. Uh, but of course, that would then lie back down into the uh, into the truck trailer when it comes to an actual launch. Uh, oxidizer handling is provided with from within the 40 foot white container that is closest to the trailer. Kerosene handling is provided from the 20 foot white container that's then ne next on the left. We have compressed gas control because it's it's purely pressure fed this particular vehicle, uh, pressure fed with helium, so that is handled by the blue container. And then we've got a portable generator at the back. Uh, so it uh, really is a, a, a very minimal infrastructure. Excel, of course, will require something more substantial, but we have a good example of, what, of the sort of thing that we're, we're looking towards coming up. Uh, this vehicle will be recoverable by parachute um, and sea landing. And uh, depending on payload is capable of something like 100 to 120 kilometers altitude. Our uh, next major step forward at the end of the year, uh, again, fortunately, within one of the um, was one of the times when we were able to, to move around a little bit more, was uh, the first test firing of our uh, third stage, our completed XL um, third stage with uh, the uh, 350 kilo thrust LEO engine. And this is a full finished flight weight version of the stage. Uh, we can see it on the left-hand side of the cutaway up within the fairing of the vehicle itself. And again, these same um, filament overwrapped spherical tanks, uh, which we produce in hand in house, are used as prope uh, propellant and pressurization tanks within the third stage, because the third stage uh, is remains pressure fed. And then they are the basis of the pressurization tanks for the second and first stage, which are turbo pump fed. Um, actually, but something before we move on to the actual the view of this, which I forget about the XL test, uh, about the L test that we did in the summer, is as far as we can determine, um, uh, those of you here may well be able to, to confirm, or, um, confirm or, or redirect us. We think the L test in the Highlands was the first complete bi-liquid vehicle stage test in the UK since Black Arrow R3. Um, I haven't been able to find out when the last Blue Streak was tested at Spade Adam, um, but I presume as that flew in November 71, both stage tests would have been done in 71. Uh, I, I, I did confirm that Black Arrow was, I think, June or July 71 before it was shipped to August, uh, shipped to uh, Australia. So we think um, that stage test was the first UK by liquid stage test since then, but um, as I say, but members here may well be able to advise me, uh, confirm or, or, or deny that. Which brings us on to our, our then our uh, by liquid upper stage test. We um, put this uh, stand together uh, to, um, uh, uh, as you see from containerized solution. Uh, we're looking to do everything as effective as cost effectively and modular and portable as possible and uh, so this solution worked out very well for us and it's quite uh, it's quite striking uh, in the response that we got to it the some some in the sort of more general comments were casting aspersions on the fact that we were using containers and those actually in the space industry and engineering were impressed that we were using containers in this, uh, this uh, creative way So as the text was mentioning, it ran through a complete flight profile uh, as if it had been deployed from the second stage and was put, placing payloads into orbit uh, with one very long burn, um, a representative half an hour wait, and then two further ignitions. Uh, the catalytic ignition with the peroxide engines, uh, of course, makes them, them very, uh, very resilient to relight in orbit, which we feel is one of our advantages. And um, that this 
upper stage does have the potential to be uh, used for other purposes. So if we're doing a smaller, uh, if, if we're doing a cluster launch, we'll be able to conveniently relight and push other payloads into other orbits. Um, if we're doing a, a launch that has spare capacity with the upper stage, it has the potential for it to then move into another place to, to do, perform another task or to be launched uh, by itself as a payload on our vehicle or on others to be used as a space stuff for, uh, for the potential of debris removal and that, and that sort of thing. So we're, we're hopeful that this can provide a, 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 a broader positive impact on space beyond uh, our program itself. Uh, with regards to launch, um, we're, our focus, uh, as well as our, our trip to Iceland, our focus is on launch from the UK. We want to be able to provide that complete solution within the UK. Uh, and indeed, of, of course, we have the opportunity, um, leaving, <laughs> leaving aside the questions of independence, that sort of thing, separate to that, just from a business point of view, even within Scotland itself, uh, we have the opportunity to provide a complete ecosystem with spacecraft construction in Glasgow, uh, space data handling in, in Edinburgh, uh, uh, space downlink from um, Dundee as the ground station recovers from its move, and we're hoping the Skywarrow to be able to provide the, the missing like a launch and then the launch sites. So we have not as yet selected, uh, settled on one particular launch site. We are friends and uh, uh, friends and collaborators with all three of the uh, locations that are interested in becoming UK spaceport. And uh, we're contributing information to all three spaceports efforts to secure planning and to plan their logistics. So uh, we, we look forward to um, seeing uh, which one or few succeed. And we, we're, uh, we're keen to, to work with, with all of them. They all have their own pros and cons. So um, I, can quite see a, uh, I could quite see the possibility of, of more than one uh, succeeding and, and offering different uh, aspects. So on the right-hand side, uh, we've also got a shot of our inspiration for our orbital activities, which is Falcon 1 on Omelec in the South Pacific, um, before they had reassured the US enough that they were, they were allowed to launch in America itself. And um, the spaceports typically show Mahia as a good example, which of course it is, of the kind of infrastructure that the Scottish spaceport could build up to, the New Zealand launch site. Um, but uh, for ourselves, we're looking to have an even more minimal footprint as can be uh, as was used for for Falcon One, where things continue to be containerized, containerized systems, ISO tanks, um, minimal structure on on the the ground, at least for everything to get going. And then, as the spaceports build up, they can build towards a more uh, permanent infrastructure. And then, of course, we can take advantage of the more permanent infrastructure. So we are. Uh, we believe in a in a strong position now. Um, we are making good progress with our practical tests. Uh, L is essentially ready for flight, and we uh, are working towards uh, the expectation of being able to fly Skylark L this year. Um, because following its ground test last summer, it is it is essentially complete and ready to go. Uh, the major news for us this year. Uh, was that we succeeded in, re in receiving ESA boost funding. So that's our first institutional funding, uh, 3 million euros, which is specifically targeted on raising the technology ready readiness level of our turbopump fed engine that we use as a cluster in the first stage and a single in the second stage, and the integrated stage testing of those stages. Um, as with Black Arrow, we have a, a, a cluster of in in this case nine rather than eight uh, in the first stage and then uh, but we're we're by liquid second stage we're using the same engine in a, a in a SpaceX manner with a a, a nozzle extension and our uh, engines our turbopump fed engines like uh, the gamma are peroxide uh, peroxide decomposed steam turbine turbopumps which give us the advantage of much lower turbine temperature versus a a combustion uh, turbo pump uh, and uh, simpler ignition, simpler operation. However, what we are doing with uh, our engine, uh, a 70 kilonewton 
engine is recovering the oxygen rich exhaust from the turbo pump which brings about one of the one of the challenges that we we've, we've not yet uh, uh, really confirmed is what you call an engine push, uh, on that proceeding on that way because it's not staged combustion it could be uh, staged uncombustion possibly staged decomposition a closed cycle uh, peroxide turbo pump with exhaust recovered to the chamber so um, we, uh, we we're in a strong position we're making good progress on our technology and uh, we hope to see some um, but rather more ambitious launches than those that we have uh, all, we have made goose, good use of so far as our own bespoke technology starts to take flight this year and next year and building towards the um, XL launch uh, potentially towards the end of 22, beginning of 23. I think that's just about on time. So um, I'd like to hand over for any questions. That was a brilliant talk, Robin. Thank you so much. Thank you um, very much. Yeah. Um, so, so everyone, um, just to remind you, we are we are recording today. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you to tentatively unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question and to try and attract my attention, which you can either do uh, visually or you can uh, add it to the the chat, um, and I can pick it up from there. Let me just, uh, we're doing a whole lot of clever pinnings today, so I'm just going to remove pins and see if we can actually get back to. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, Certainly. Or... I go to the gallery. I could also, I could swap over to my uh, to audio on my camera uh, login if that makes it easier. Yes, please. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. Um, right. Um, so, um, so as I was switching over there, so I think the first one I can see in top row is Robert Law. Robert? Right. Thanks. Right. That was fascinating. Right. Uh, I, I, I live in Dundee. I work at the observatory in Dundee. And I noticed you said something that there'd be a downlink at Dundee. Could you, could you tell me a bit more? I'm presuming that's at the university. Certainly. Yes. So um, the... Um, the, I know there's, there's been the long-standing ground station at the university. They've uh, I, they've recently moved from the university, I understand, uh, but they've been able to establish a new site at uh, the old RAF Errol Airfield. Right. right. Um, so uh, the the what I understand there was quite some concern uh, when the, uh, uh, the university closed it off, uh, but they've been able to to recover and uh, establish as a new company, I think. Right, that's fantastic. Thanks. Right. Okay, next um, I've got uh, Hania is asking two questions. First of all, about the recording. Uh, the recording um, will be on the BIS website in the members area. It will also be, uh, I think, believed on, sh shared on the Facebook group, the West Midlands uh, Facebook group. And she's also got a question for Robin, which is, uh, could you expand on the experience of, your of the funding process? Uh, certainly. So we uh, we're in a fortunate position uh, in that we're a, uh, a, a founder. Uh, the, the move into space technology was a decision of the founder rather than, so it's, it's, it's the money went looking for the engineers instead of the engineers looking for the money. And um, we know that uh, I think almost exclusively the space programs, that, the space companies that have succeeded have uh, been the ones that have been that way around. Um, uh, e even um, even some which really looked like they were progressing very well that had come solely from an engineering background ultimately uh, stopped. So we're in a fortunate position that our founder is a space enthusiast. Uh, but now uh, the major step forward for us is the ESA funding, um, which is um, providing a very useful uh, chunk towards specific activities for the orbital vehicle itself. Um, it's um, it's the first time for, for myself. It's the first time I've seen a, a bid process, and the level of detail that goes into it is quite extraordinary. The team that uh, put together the bid for us spelt, spent a, a very great amount of time putting it together in great detail, and uh, it's it's 
it's their great achievements that we have uh, made this leap forward now towards being um, re receiving institutional funding. Great. Um, let's see who's next. Um, uh, Richard Newlands. Richard, did you have a question about the weather? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Um, sorry about my appearance. I've uh, been somewhat ronad. <laughs> so all the way. Hi, Robin. Um, that was a fascinating talk, and I'm just absolutely loving all of that, especially the littler vehicles. So were some superb launches. Um, yeah, I was just asking. Um, there was a lot of talk um, in the BIS when we did a little study about uh, small launch vehicles, about um, the uh, the wind at some of the Scottish spaceports. Um, it's rather windy up there, and what effect that might have on uh, future launch vehicles. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's um, it, it's definitely going to present uh, more of a challenge for us than than some more southerly sites. Uh, but we have, uh, we, for, our, for ourselves internally, we have surveyed the, the weather and we, we are uh, confident that there is um, sufficient opportunity, uh, opportunity within the winds to be viable. Um, and that at least with, with a maritime location, uh, although it can change quite quickly, the, um, the, the, the flow above the boundary layer tends to be pretty pretty consistent mm -hmm. uh, because we haven't got no, very many obstructions uh, in front of us. So um, I, it, it has provided uh, it has provided challenges with us for some of the smaller vehicles when we, we've had to wait a, a, a little longer. It looks like uh, the larger ones will, being guided and being a larger mass, the, the larger ones will be slightly more forgiving than the smaller ones. Um, uh, so um, it's going to be interesting to see how it develops. We do think that that's one of the advantages that uh, a storable system gives us um, in that uh, leaving aside sort of orbital requirements, uh, as long as it's, it doesn't get too windy for the vehicle to remain out physically outside, uh, we can fill up and we can wait. We can have very long launch windows because we, we don't have cryogens on board. Well, that's cunning. So you, you basically just sit and wait for a wait for a, a narrow weather window and then you've got the opportunity to go for it. It, it, it is something that um, is an opportunity for us then. Yep. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Good idea. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, um, Alan Marlow. Alan, uh, you want to ask about uh, payloads? Yes, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so we're, we're um, uh, with Excel, we're looking at uh, approximately 315 kilos into a 500 kilometer sun sink. Uh, obviously, we can we can do as slightly more, slightly higher, and uh, slightly more into polar. Uh, so we, we will be able to uh, launch. Um, we can provide a, a single dedicated launch to some of the payloads, the sort of things that Surrey Satellite would put together or uh, Lockheed Martin's small satellite range, or we could provide a convenient uh, cluster launch for, for smaller yet satellites and then exploit our read light capability. Uh, to be able to spread them out where they really want to, to to go, rather than just being beholden to a prime payload. Great. Um, next up, um, who's it? Uh, John Bonser. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, hi, Robin. Uh, excellent talk. Clearly, Skyrun has made a great deal of progress in a very structured, well-planned way. Um, so thanks, thanks for all that. Um, I, I'm wondering, where, where you, I've actually got two questions, really. Uh, first of all, where do you plan or hope to launch uh, Skylark uh, L from? Uh, and the second question is, there's been some discussion about, and some, some, some people 
I don't want to call this a conspiracy, but some people have who know about these things have some concern that uh, a lot of favoritism is being shown to the very large corporations like Lockheed Martin and others who may seek to hog the Scottish spaceports, you know, seal them up in, in exclusive deals. And in fact, the British government isn't really supporting the homegrown uh, teams at all. I don't know whether you have any comment on that. I don't, I don't have a view one way or the other because I don't know enough. But I'm just a little bit concerned to hear this happening, uh, that this might be happening. So that's my two questions. So um, we, we're still, uh, the, there are a, a number of options for a VL launch. They're still being developed at the moment, but uh, it does look feasible. Uh, that it will be um, this year, and hopefully we'll be able to announce what where we've settled on shortly. Um, in terms of the um, the sort of the, as you say with with larger corporations, we have the question about uh, Lockheed, whether it's a sort of Sutherland or Shetland and that sort of thing. Um, certainly, our 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 experience with the space agency has been very positive. Um, so we. Uh, we we have felt supported and engaged with. So overall, our, our experience is positive, um, and uh, it, it will be interesting to see what happens if uh, uh, Lockheed is able to bring ABL to Shetland as they are talking about and, uh, as soon as next year. Um, it could, uh, I could see that it could certainly provide a, a lever to help get things moving. Although, of course, we would like to be first. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. That's that, that's good to hear. I, I, as I say, I, 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 that's why I asked the question. I, you have more of an inside view than, than I have, so that's that's quite reassuring. Thank you. And good luck in finding a launch site, by the way. I'm sorry, <laughs> we, we can't. This is a launch site in North Ayrshire, about ten miles from where I am, only <laughs> up to twenty thousand feet. So I'm sorry, we can't <laughs> help you there. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, I think I meant to read this one out. Uh, so Robin Brown's asking. Um, uh, when the XL will be operational. So you're flying it, you're planning to fly in 2023. When will it be operational? And he's also asking, do you envisage a global market large enough to sustain operations? Yes. So, um, uh, let's say we, we're, we're uh, I suppose it's best described as the, uh, if, if everything goes right date, Musk time, um, uh, potentially towards the end of 22 to, for the first flight. So pro probably we're looking into the beginning of 23 and um, of, of course it depends then on on how that first flight goes but uh, we are taking quite a a cautious approach and we hope that uh, the, the intent with that with SKL is to remove some of the risk to to practice is to work out some of the risks and challenges that we would have had if we jumped straight to XL sooner um, so it is feasible that we could make a start on commercial operation then uh, on the second launch or indeed on the first if people are willing to, to pay to, to ride on the first launch uh, the, um, the the studies from a from a number of locations uh, certainly suggest that there's a significant market available um, and that there, there is enough to support uh, more than one UK launcher um, obviously, the bet it's better to be there first, but um, uh, uh, it, it looks like uh, two or three entities operating from the UK is viable. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks very much, uh, Robin. Can I just uh, in interject there as well, Bob, that um, on the uh, going back to the weather conditions in Scotland, yes, they are they can be can be very windy. And on the SLV study, which um, uh, I was involved with, what we established was that wind shear is the limiting factor, very much the limiting factor as far as the launch window is concerned. So you have a design trade off that if you make your vehicle able to withstand a particular degree of wind shear, there's a trade off there, as I say, that um, you, you extend your launch window opportunities if your vehicle can withstand, uh, you know, a stronger or uh, a worse wind shear effect. So perhaps I can recommend that to your structural engineers to have a look at. Yes, yes, I'll be interested to see it. Okay, um, so I just just before I move on to the next question, I'm um, sort of 
uh, I noticed in uh, this month's JBS, which I received a couple of days ago in the post, um, there's a, a paper about surveying the launcher market. Uh, it's quite interesting. I only, I only just skimmed it. I didn't get to, I haven't got to read it before today. Um, for those who are members in half Um Next up, I've got uh, two people asking similar questions. So uh, our, our own Amelia Stanton, um, I, I, we were expecting her to have a, uh, a question about additive manufacture. And, uh, and uh, Steve Salmon's jumped on the bandwagon. He wants to know the same, uh, pretty much. Um, so you were pretty coy in saying what materials. I think you said it's super alloy, but uh, what materials do you use for, for the rocket, specifically combustion chamber? And how much of the rocket do you additively manufacture? Oh, it's okay. It's, it is in canal uh, that we're using. Um, uh, uh, it, 718, one of the, the um, sort of conveniently, conventionally available printed ones. Um, it's, uh, it's all about the engines. Um, that's our focus with the printing. Um, we feel that uh, that's, that's where we can best make use of it and that there are quicker and easier ways of making the rest of the vehicle. I'm fascinated by, um, I think, is it relativity that are looking to print the entire vehicle? Um, it, um, it, it just seems easier to fabricate tanks <laughs> in, in a more uh, traditional way. I mean, we are doing um, uh, overwrapped. We're doing filament composite overwrapped tanks. Um, so we we uh, that's our approach to the the, the integral tanks. But um, the the printing is is focused on the engine itself. Great. Um, right. Um... Okay. Uh, another question from Hania. Um... Uh, Hania, do you want to ask any of these questions yourself? <laughs> I've been doing it too. Uh, good evening. Um, apologies, I, I, I'm typing because there's a lot of background noise. But yes, I would like to ask that um, what have been your biggest challenges in, to, in getting to where you, you are today? It looks like you, you, you've had quite a lot of success. Um, and yeah, you are well on your way to achieving your future goals that you mentioned. So could you shed some light on what some of those challenges were and how you overcame? And, and any advice would be very valuable. Uh, Thank you. Is, is that in terms of uh, the, the enterprise, of the, the, the efforts of the company or myself? Uh, efforts of the company mainly uh, in terms of uh, the company itself and some of the engineering challenges. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so um, at the beginning, we had expected that we'd do, we would be slightly more horizontally integrated. We thought we could draw more on outside suppliers, um, and what we have found progressively is we've, we've we've ended up doing more and more in house, which I know actually is what SpaceX did. Um, they they set out uh, expecting to be able to uh, draw things in and be more more of just an assembly, um, but uh, we have found that we, we, we're best off doing more. Uh, the the, uh, the interstages, uh, creating our own tanks. Uh, we thought we would be able to secure the filament, uh, filament overwrap tanks for Excel externally, but um, nobody could quite do the balance of pressure and volume. Um, so we, we now, we've done that internally, and at least that gives us the advantages that we, we have control of that and has led us to be able to make our own spherical tank for XL. Um, and um, various small bits and pieces like that, uh, which have, it's meant it's taken longer because we've had to develop our own stuff, but at least it puts us in a stronger position now. Um, and um, uh, then overall, it has been a, a challenge in, um, uh, in the outreach side of things, sort of finding locations for activities and stuff, because whenever and whenever anybody hears rocket, they automatically assume that it's going to be flying, um, and uh, it's not necessarily the case unless we're, unless we're specifically looking at launch sites. So, uh, yes, I would say the the move from external sourcing to sort of horizontal integration towards more vertical integration, the extra time it takes to do that, and the the uh, the extra time than what I might have expected in, in finding locations for, for tests and activities and stuff. 
Okay, um, I'm just going to move on really quickly. So next up, we've got um, Alex Wood. You've got a question about the limiting factors of additive manufacture. Alex, do you want to add a, ask that? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll ask it for you then. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I think you mentioned earlier that uh, Relativity are, are, are looking to print an entire uh, uh, vehicle yeah. of additive manufacture. And so Alex is asking um, um, about uh, what the limiting factors are. Certainly. So um, currently the, the volume available, um, as you can see, when the, as you saw with the photograph of the three ton, it's uh, broken up into sections uh, because those are the largest bits that will fit the, um, the major printers that are available currently. But that is improving. And so uh, we, can, we will be able to further cut down the parts as printer volume improves. And the opportunity for ourselves with our, our in-house printer that is not then a, a powder bed one. Um, so I, I, it's going to be very interesting to see how see what relativity relativity do. And I guess there, if you're set up to be able to print the whole vehicle, there must be other advantages that you can draw from it. Maybe that maybe uh, further incorporation of parts. Uh, I I think it's it's easier to fabricate tanks directly rather than sort of icing them which is pretty much what they're doing it's a robot arm with the de deposition building stuff up um but uh, yes it's going to be great to see what they do and um we we for ourselves we think we've got the right balance of printing the engines that uh, the technology is really good there and then using other systems for the the other structures <laughs> Great, that's great. Uh, Alex, I was going to say, uh, make sure you um, you register for Amelia's talk on additive manufacture in July. Um, right. Uh, next, uh, Malcolm D, uh, you've got a, a question about time scale to produce uh, an engine. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 um, so I just wondered what the um, the manufacturing time of it, if you're doing your own in-house uh, production and such like, and I thought. How quickly could you produce an engine from individual components to being bolted to a machine? Um, well, it, it's still um, it's still developing. We're still we're still getting the uh, uh, still working on it. Um, the in-house printer will certainly speed it up because at the moment what we need to do is get uh, uh, externally printed um, powder bed parts. And then, and nobody currently uh, that we could that we could find for supply was able to do both the printing and the manufacturing of the big enough part. The, sorry, the printing and post machining of the big enough mm. parts. So we have to source it to one people, and then do the post machining, and then it uh, goes and, and then weld it up. So our own printer. So so it's it's been a number of months with the current ones, with the developmental ones. But once we get into production and uh, assuming our own one comes together, which it, it, it is looking very promising, we should be able to shorten that dramatically because that, our own system will be able to print and machine in place so we can do bigger bits. We need less welding. We need less clearing, uh, cleaning. And there's no transfer from one machine or, or indeed one company to another. So, so time scale projecting maybe? I'm still okay. Fine. Fine. <laughs> I did, it did cross my mind if uh, if you become so proficient to produce engines, if you can start producing them for um, so-called rival companies. We uh, we wouldn't be opposed to it. Certainly, no. if, it, <laughs> if it makes sense. <laughs> Good. Okay. So well, thank you. Next question is it's about competition as well. Um, Jenny, you've got uh, some questions about uh, competitors. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you for your presentation. I just wondered where you saw yourself in terms of uh, your competition and, and who would be your main rival and whether you saw Horizontal Launch um, as also being a direct competitor or do you see them in a slightly different mark? Um, uh, I, th I think we're well placed. Uh, obviously, um, uh, Rocket Labs are the, the, the ones that are up and running in this sector and uh, doing tremendously well. But I think that's to the advantage of everybody because they're proving that it's, they're proving that it's possible on this scale. Um, I, I know originally there was talk of them potentially coming to Scotland, but I don't think there's any point 
uh, given the facility they have in New Zealand and the new facility they have in the US. I think they're well covered for what they need. Um, Virgin obviously is uh, in expecting to operate from Newquay. And um, I think there's, a, there's inevitably some overlap, but they have got a slightly different, I, it escapes at the moment, I can't remember what their total payload is. Um, but uh, they've got a slightly different payload and uh, different opportunities with the air launch vehicle. So they, they will presumably be able to access other orbits that uh, we can't be in UK based vertical ones. So I think it's, uh, it's different niches with the horizontal takeoff. Um, there's, uh, there's various competitors across Europe that we know varying amounts about. Um, I guess it tends to be uh, in normal times when there is the conferences, conferences and things going on, it tends to be a relatively sort of friendly competition. Um, I've, um, I've previously in the, the past, we've, uh, we've spoken most to uh, PLD and to NAMO, uh, who uh, P PLD would be equivalent um, from Spain. And they, they've had some very good infrastructure set up in Spain. I think, they've, I think they've had a bit of a delay, though, in funding. Nano or, sorry, NAMO in Norway are looking at a, a vehicle which is very much smaller, sort of providing dedicated launch to, um, uh, to nano satellites. Um, the German operators, uh, ISAR and uh, Rocket Factory Augsburg, are coming along very well. They've got uh, plans set up variously with Sweden and I think with Shetland. High impulse is an interesting one where they're actually looking to do hybrids, um, which um, it, speaking as somebody who started with hybrid engines surprises me somewhat that someone would be looking to do use hybrids in, in orbital launch. Uh, they've actually got a, a, a LOX, a LOX um, hydrocarbon hybrid and last I heard a, a LOX ethanol turbopop to operate it. So it's going to be fascinating to see what uh, happens with, with their system as it's been quite different. Uh, Orbex, of course, are um, the, uh, the, the most well-known uh, UK competitor. Um, and and I, I know some people involved, but uh, as, in, as in I won't tell them the, the details about Skyrora, they won't tell me the details about Orbex. So because uh, Orbex have opted to take a, a much quieter approach, um, we, uh, we, we don't know how far along they are. They, uh, uh, they, they may be about to turn up with something that surprises everybody, or they, or they may have further to go than they say. We, we shall see. Um, but I think there's, there's definitely the, the market studies uh, suggest that there is uh, plenty of uh, sufficient opportunity, shall we say, within the UK for the organizations that we know have actually progressed the hardware the progress beyond the website and PowerPoint stage. <laughs> That's great. I've got uh, one more question from Richard Newlands. He's asking, uh, are you considering uh, 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 lower stage reuse eventually? Um, at the moment, uh, at the moment, not. At the moment, it's uh, just, as you can appreciate, it's just getting up and running. Um, and there's, mixture, there's a mixture across the, the sector until Rocket Labs decided that they'd be able to have a go at reuse. All of the small uh, companies were just, were just focusing on expendable, because as you know, there's, there's less mass available proportionately for the systems to do it. But I, it, it has struck me since, since SpaceX started it, they, that um, they will force everybody to look at doing it. So it's certainly something we've got our eye on um, and will be Looking, looking very carefully at once we've progressed to the stage of operating. To say that there are much better ways of doing it than the way SpaceX are doing it just at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> like well, it. one of the interesting, it's, it's very interesting to see uh, Rocket Lab's um, enterprise with, with helicopter catching, which I, I think was developed um, actually as, one, a, yeah. as a product. So we could always, we could certainly look at that as well as a possibility. Yeah, I always thought that was that kind of thing was a much better way of doing it. They did their initial testing. Um, I think it was West Brew or something, but it was done in Scotland. Actually, it's interesting footage. Oh, well, I shall have a look for that one. Yeah. Okay. I've got uh, next off. I've got a question from Ian Kennedy. Ian, do you want to ask your question about uh, space launch regulations? 
Yeah, and um, thanks very much, Robin. That's been an absolutely fascinating lecture. Um, I suspect quite a lot of the people here have uh, been following the sort of consultation and things that have gone over the last year with the space launch regulations, me very much as an amateur. I'd just be interested to hear a professional's opinion of the outcome. Has it been, a, from the point of view of a launch provider, has it been a, a good outcome, a bad outcome, a mixed bag? What's the what's the take-home message of whether it's been... A- yes, yes, it, it, um, it, has, it has been progressing well. And... Um, the, the completion of the Space Industry Act has been delayed, and uh, I think overall it's, it, it initially was the extra drain on the civil service from, from the Brexit process, and then obviously through the last year as well. Um, but the, uh, it's nearly there. I understand it's expected to become come into action uh, sort of this summer, maybe, maybe late summer, so we'll finally have everything in place. But um, we've had, uh, for ourselves, for our own experience, we've had very good exchanges with the UK Space Agency and with the CAA as well as they, they will become the, uh, the technical regulator, which, which uh, makes good sense as uh, they're building on their, all their aviation experience. Thank you. Uh, great. Next up, uh, uh, Brody Stanhope. Uh, Brody, you've got a question about... Um, uh, the rocket labs uh, neutron launcher for satellite constellations and uh, and uh, and whether Sky Aurora will be looking to develop along similar lines. It's, it's certainly something that we'd, we'd we'd consider that we'd bear in mind when we get up and running. Um, and you know, there's there's so much so many different things that we'd we'd like to do given the chance. Um, but once we get uh, XL operating, uh, there's there aren't. There aren't currently firm plans, but uh, if if we're in a strong position and there's the opportunity there, then uh, we'd certainly consider it. Um, Skyro XXL, presumably. <laughs> That's great. Okay, I'm just looking now. Are there any more questions, everybody? Any more questions? Oh, uh, Mark, I can see your hand up. Yes. Um, hi, Robin. Thanks very much. It's been excellent. Um, I've got a whole series of questions, actually. Sorry. <laughs> Um, first off, the diagrams you showed on your liquid propellant vehicles earlier, did I understand from the diagram that you're, you're looking at a toroidal tank, like the old German Type 1 design? Yes. Excellent. I've always <laughs> been fascinated by the idea of this. John's laughing as well, I can see. Would you like to say a few words about the... Um, the reasons for choosing that to royal design um i'm guessing it also helps you with your structural uh structural strength um but i'll leave you to to to, to explain yeah. it and then if i if you don't mind i've got a couple more questions on other topics so, yes, so we, well um uh, we feel it's it's a particular opportunity for efficiency with um uh, reducing the mass you know with a, essentially a very minimal divider provided it's successfully leak tight uh, between the two um it's a good opportunity with us being peroxide uh peroxide kerosene so we've got a good match of the temperatures and um the mixture ratio being o- over six for the peroxide uh, it, it's a good ratio then for the, the 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 balance of the outer and inner tank um and um one of the, the the nice add-ons being the plumbing that uh, it brings all your propellants together at the bottom. So uh, it's the the first test uh, structures of the largest tanks are starting to come together now. Excellent. It also uh, for Robin Robin Brand who mentioned the uh, wind shear problem. It will help with the structural integrity of the vehicle having a a double walled tube tubed vehicle um you can produ- produce a nice uh, a strong vehicle thank you for that um next question um the powder bed add- additive manufacturing have you experienced any problems with porosity um i know some of the early uh, powder bed experiments had problems with porosity uh, have you had that problem um, in some of the early ones, in some of the, the, the first test pieces, um, it was showing up. Um, but we were able to, with with our supplier, we were able to resolve it by uh, by changing the 
the the patterns and the rates at which it was working. So um, yes, it is something we encountered, but we have been able to get around it. Excellent. Can you can you say what you've done to? Is that a commercial in confidence, or can you say what you've done to get around uh, it? It, it is uh, just in terms of uh, for for the given printer, it's in terms of the feed rate, and uh, it's it's just settings <laughs> on right. the on the system. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, are you, in the engine, the, the engines that you're developing, are you using fuel film cooling? I, uh, no, we're, we're um, just a purely uh, regenerative uh, sure. cooling. Marvellous. And the last last thing uh, for now, this is a bit of a cheat. The branch is hoping to run another propulsion conference next year in April. Um, really like to have um, you guys talking about your your yeah the engines yeah, uh, in more detail if you're if you would it be april next year we again we it was westcott whether it'll be westcott next 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 year i don't know it's early stages at the moment but uh, if you are interested we'd love to have a, a a talk on the engine cycle and the engine development yes that'd be great when we should have um uh, by by that time we we should have uh, had the 70 kilonewton up and running to, oh, to, to show videos of. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, right. Uh, anyone? Are there any more any more questions? If anybody's got a question, now's the time. Don't be shy. Track my attention somehow. Uh, Robin Brand. Yeah, if I can pick up the um, the theme there of satellite constellation launches and similar. Within the UK, there's the, I shall call the MOOC, the SLOMV, the Orbital Maneuvering Vehicle, which I understand is going to be built in Reading. Um, that provides that sort of capability of loitering and launching things into different orbits and planes and so on. Is that something which Skyrora anticipate being able to launch? Um, and in terms of the, the, the MOOC system itself? Or, um, I mean... Our, our upper stage should provide that sort of capability uh, as well. Um, but overall, we, we, we would very much be interested in, in anything that fits in that people want to launch with us who would be looking to do so. Thank you. OK, anybody else? Is there anybody else that has a question before we uh, close today's session? I I think that's it. Nothing on the chat. In that case, that, uh, all that remains now is to um, to thank Robin so much. It's been such a treat today, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, and uh, it's actually it's the first time we've been exposed to additive manufacture in any detail. It's been really great, um, and I know we've got some some more coming on that topic in, in, in a few months' time. Um, uh, so, Robin, thank you very much indeed. Yep. Thank you very much, Robin. Very much. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity.